The staff and I have been working through a book called The Rise of Nuns. That's N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. This book is fascinating to us because it talks about the exploding number of people here in the United States that classify themselves as having no religious affiliation. Not Christian, not Muslim, not Jewish, not Buddhist, not Wiccan, not atheist, not Satanist, nothing, none, no labels at all. They claim to be spiritual, just that their spirituality is not connected with any particular religion. When asked about, well, what is it about Christianity that you guys just don't want to have an affiliation with, you get the usual suspects. You know, they say Christians are judgmental. Christians fight too much among themselves. They say that Christians are um, hypocrites. And of course, you hear the one that, well, and churches always are asking for money. I'm sensitive to that last one. You know, I liken it to taxes. I don't mind paying taxes for things that are necessary, but it really bugs me when a politician tells me I'm not paying enough taxes when I see how they're wasting our tax money. It just gets to me. I don't mind contributing money to things that are needed, emergency things, hurricane relief, American Red Cross. I don't mind contributing money to uh, special causes, Lutheran World Relief, or even our Free to Grow campaign. But getting those calls at dinner time from organizations and groups who want money, I don't like being hounded that way. So when it comes to Stewardship Education Month in November here, I always get a bit antsy because I don't want to hound people either. At the same time, I would be derelict in my duty if I didn't teach the people what God teaches us in Scripture. You've probably heard the statistics that over 70% of Jesus' parables dealt with money, that half his teaching deals with finances and handling the goods that he has given to us. And, of course, a large segments of St. Paul's letters deal with stewardship. Now, back in January on Life Sunday, when we talked about how Lutherans are pro-life, I mentioned that oftentimes people know what we stand for and what we stand against, but don't know the reason behind that, the scriptures, the basis for which we take our stance. And so what I did is I picked out or I showed you those scriptures in which um, tell, tell us about why we say that we as Lutherans are pro-life and that why we consider abortion murder. So I wanted to do something similar tonight. I wanted to pick out those scriptures in the Bible that talk about what God's expectations are of us. Now, I use the word expectations on purpose because just like the Ten Commandments aren't God's ten suggestions, so God's teachings aren't God's suggestions either. They are God's expectations. That's why in the bulletin you have this insert. And... I'm going to go through this insert with you because, again, this way you see for yourself what the Bible says about stewardship, about tithing. And it's not me grinding an axe, and it's not me hounding you. It's me simply telling you this is what God's Word says, leaving it up to you as is proper, how you hear and respond to what God says to you. The first thing that I have on there, again, is just defining what is tithing, because there's a, sometimes, you know, people have different ideas. Tithing is the scriptural practice of returning to the Lord the first 10% of all my income as an offering to the Lord. Tithing was practiced both in the Old and New Testaments, and tithing is God's expectation to remind us that the first and best of everything belongs to Him as an offering. And that first thing, that first fruits, is, is really um, something that began um, with 
remember the exodus that we just had where we had the Passover and the firstborn of everyone uh, in Egypt was killed except for the blood that was on the Passover. From that time on, God said the firstborn of everything belongs to him. And you had to redeem that firstborn if you wanted to keep him. There was a sacrifice. If your firstborn son was, you wanted to keep that firstborn son, you had to offer a sacrifice to redeem that firstborn because God says the first of everything belongs to him. So what does the Bible say about tithing? The tithe is God's established standard. In Malachi 3, which was what our Old Testament lesson was about, you heard God talking to the people of Israel through the prophet. He says, he he asked, you know, how are we robbing you? The people ask, how are we robbing you? And the Lord responds in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So God established the tithe as his portion, the first fruit. Even before God made it a requirement of his people, the faithful considered the tithe God's portion. If you look in Genesis 14, it, there's a section in there that after Abraham rescued his, his nephew Lot from those who had captured him, he rescued him. It says that Abram, and this is even before God said, calls, starts calling him Abraham, you know, after the blessing there, even before that, it says that once he made that capture, then the Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands, those four kings that attacked and captured Lot. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So even before it was established, that was being practiced. In Genesis 28, Jacob, when he was being chased by Esau, said, Lord, if you let me go, if you watch over me on my journey and, that I'm taking and give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I safely return to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So even before it was established, people practiced, God's people practiced the tithe. Now sometimes they say the tithe or God's expectation of the tithe is done away with in the New Testament. But if you look at Matthew 20, 23 here, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Now note, he says, you should have practiced the latter, tithing, without neglecting the former. So Jesus isn't saying stop tithing here. He's saying practice tithing, but what's more important is that in your lives you practice justice. You practice mercy and be faithful. That to God is more important. In 1 Corinthians 16, St. Paul says, he says, on the first day of each week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Proportionate giving, that 10% again, is what St. Paul is talking about. In 2 Corinthians 8, which is our gospel, le our epistle lesson, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. So God's expectation of us is still the tithe. That has not changed. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever in his purpose and will for people's lives. But what often we do is we forget the promises and don't look at the promises that God also gives us in Scripture. Because God gives us specific promises to those who practice the tithe. 
you will harvest what you sow, he says. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You know, a couple years ago when we were going through the midst of the drought, you know, in 2011, especially that, that was the summer in which we had like 52 days over 100 degrees, I asked a couple of farmers around here, I said, so are you going to plant wheat this fall because we hadn't had any rain? And they said, well, you know, there's one sure way of not having a crop, and that's not sowing at all. And lo and behold, they sowed wheat, and we had plenty of moisture over the winter and in the spring so that they had a great crop in 2012. Not so much in this spring, but, but in that spring, they had a great crop. Again, St. Paul is saying, you know, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. Also, get, and in Luke... Jesus says, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you also. God actually promises to restore the tithe with blessings for those who give it. And oftentimes, like I said, we forget this part of it. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness." Now, that doesn't mean that if you give the tithe, that that tithe will come back to you in cash. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but God has a way of restoring that tithe to us. You're like, well, what do you mean by that? Look at Malachi 3, especially verse 11 there. When he says, when he talks about after bringing the whole tithe in, God says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, The vines of your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe. So in that agricultural society, God was saying, okay, I'll restore it because I'll make it that you have a greater crop. That's how I'll restore your tribe. How does God do it for us today? Well, we may not know exactly how or recognize it. Maybe it's not getting sick. Maybe it's preventing an accident from happening that could sap some of your money. You just never know how God restores that tithe. There are various ways in which he promises to do that for those who give the tithe. But always remember that there is that promise that God will restore the tithe with blessing. But then, who should not tithe? Well, Scripture tells us about this as well. Those who do so against their will. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, nor under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So if you feel you're being compelled to do it, that you're being uh, forced to do it, God doesn't want it. God doesn't want the tithe from those who make offerings to soothe guilt over their sins. Again, in Malachi 2, 13 and 14, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks on you with, looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. This is an example in which they were living in sin. And God says, if you're giving your offering to soothe over the guilty conscience of a sin, that's not what the offering is for. In that case, as he goes on to say, you go, you repent before the Lord your God and seek his mercy and grace. Then you give your tithe as an offering of thanksgiving for the mercy that you have received for the forgiveness and repentance. Again, he doesn't want to receive those who make an offering for show or whose motive is wrong. 
Matthew 23 again. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. In other words, God doesn't want the tithe from people who do it to show to show others or make others think how good they are. That's not the right motive. 1 Corinthians 4, 4 and 5, my conscience is clear, but that, that, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At the same time, each will receive their, pa- their praise from God. So wrong motives are a wrong reason. And then Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flocks. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and on his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. That's the teachings that I wanted to highlight as what God says about how we are to handle our finances. And again, this is God's expectation of us. We do this, as Connie mentioned last week, because we have a thankful heart. A heart that is thankful because of what God has already done for us through Jesus Christ. Because in Christ, God took care of the most important thing in our lives, our salvation. He sent his son to pay the price for our sins. And in that freedom of forgiveness that we have, we can be his people, be his witnesses in this world by the things we do, the things we say. You know, there was one... uh, infamous politician who once said, um, if you have a business, you didn't build that. Well, Scripture tells us almost something similar. It says the things that you have, everything that you have, you didn't create that. God made it. And God gives it to you as stewards of his, abound, of his bounty You are his managers of the grace, the richness of a loving God who gives us everything we need and gives us the most important thing, forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So may God bless you in how you handle the richness that God grants to you. We stand.